Welcome back to the AAAS meeting in Vancouver, British Columbia. Today we're interviewing Ann Jones from Arizona State University. And Ann is giving a talk here on harvesting excess light energy to use for fuel. Could you tell us how this works, Ann? Yeah, so in general, photosynthesis is not actually a very efficient process. Um, so there's a lot of light energy that hits the sun every year that is completely ignored. Um, and part of the reason that it's ignored is because photosynthesis um, is not very good at matching light flux with actual production of reduced carbon compounds. Um, so we are trying to improve the efficiency of that process by separating the two parts of photosynthesis, separating the light from the dark so that we can optimize them separately and bring it back together. That sounds really interesting. And, and cyanobacteria are the source <laughs> of this <laughs> right. little machine? So um, the idea is to take cyanobacteria as our um, cells for harvesting light. So they absorb the solar energy and they produce electrons. That's what happens in the light reactions of photosynthesis. And then use those electrons to transfer into a second cell, a heterotrophic cell, and use that heterotrophic cell to then make fuel. Okay. So the energy really is the transfer of these electrons. Yeah, that's, that's the key of photosynthesis. Photosynthesis transforms solar energy into electrical energy. Um, and it uses the electrical energy to produce reduced carbon compounds, to produce fuels. So natural photosynthesis transfers solar energy into fuel. Um, but the intermediate is electrical energy. And so what we're proposing to do is to transfer the electrical energy between two different kinds of cells, separating photosynthesis into two species instead of one. Mm -hmm. And then how do you get the fuel out of it once you've transferred <laughs> to these heterotrophic cells? Right. Uh, it's the same problem that anyone facing a biofuel type question has. Um, ideally, you'd like to make a fuel that would then be um, excreted out of the cell, and hopefully it would be something that would just rise to the top of a culture and you could just skim it off the top. At the level, you could make some rough predictions of the <laughs> amount of energy you could make right now. Right. Right? Wh wh where are you in terms of some um, at the organisms. moment, the best organisms that grow using an electricity source are acetogens. Um, and they grow with about 0.1% efficiency, which is pretty lousy. <laughs> um, photosynthesis itself has an efficiency in, in the best plants of about 4%. But in both cases, there's no theoretical reason that you can't at least double or triple those kind of yields. It, acetogens may be terms that ah, people aren't familiar with. So. Uh, acetogens can use carbon dioxide to produce acetate. So acetate can be a fuel, but more exciting on that pathway, they make a compound called acetyl-CoA. And acetyl-CoA is a way into a lot of different kinds of synthetic pathways. So you can make a lot of different fuels if you can make acetyl-CoA. So you can not only make fuels, but in fact, you could probably produce a lot of useful products. Absolutely. As well, yeah. Right? yeah, in fact, most people interested in, in engineering of microbes or in, in improved product production in microbes imagine that first you'll make high value chemicals, right? Because to get into a commodity industry like energy, you need to have much higher efficiencies. But if you could, in the middle, hit a high value chemical, use some of the output from that to spur research to then break into the commodity market, you have a pathway towards really making a difference to energy. So if, if you imagine where you hope you'll be in a few years and what would be required for scale up, how, how large of cultures would we be looking at to generate the kind of energy that would have an impact on people's lives? Uh, well, in the next few years, we hope we'll have a functional prototype to really make all of this work. Um, and then I'll have a better guess how big will the pond size have to be. <laughs> but until we know something about the real efficiencies, I, I don't think we can, can say. Um, but we don't have a need for farmable land. We, we don't even really need land because we're talking about aquatic microbes. So um, even at current photosynthetic efficiencies, you, you wouldn't need a lot of space that's taking away from people to live. And Arizona has a lot of sunshine. So. We have plenty of sunshine to spare. <laughs> so one of the reasons people really want to move to biofuels is because we're seeing a depletion of fossil fuels. But a second reason is because of all of the byproducts of fossil fuels that harm our environment. Right. So when you, when you talk about um, cyanobacteria and, and using microorganisms to generate energy like this, are there 
byproducts that are harmful that are generated from that process as well? Um, well, so cyanobacteria on their own take only carbon dioxide and water to produce fuel, right? Um, and then when you burn it, you get the carbon dioxide and the water back at the expense of oxygen. So it's a closed cycle. Um, so of course they need some trace nutrients as well, but um, the whole cycle is closed and you don't imagine making noxious sulfur compounds or not noxious nitrogen containing compounds in the same way that you do if you burn a petrochemical. So the, then the one other environmental concern associated with any energy process is the amount of water that would be required for it. And, and that obviously is an issue here because these are aquatic organisms. Yeah, you will certainly need water to grow them, um, but I think compared to plant usage of water, you're actually in a better situation. That sounds really good. It's <laughs> very exciting to think of where we'll be a few years from now. Thank you so much Thank for talking Thank you. It's nice to now. meet you.